I'm uh, Hal Whitehead, and I'm going to talk about uh, culture in the open ocean. So first, uh, like everyone else, or nearly everyone else, uh, I, I want to talk about, um, just mention what I mean by culture. And uh, this is a very simple definition, but one that I find tractable in the rather difficult realm where I tried to do my work. And the two key aspects of it are that information's being transmitted between the individuals by social learning, and secondly, that it results in shared behavior, so the animals are doing the same thing. If you define culture like this, and then start looking across the animal um, kingdom, you find a very skewed distribution. Most species, we have no, no evidence of culture at all. In a few, like some um, song, songbirds, there's evidence of perhaps one culturally determined behavior. Now, there's a few species, like the capuchin uh, Sue was talking about, where there's much culturally determined behavior. Um, a, a very few species where um, this division is a bit controversial, but uh, <laughs> um, where culture seems to be a crucial determinant of behavior and success. And that seems to be the case in at least a few whale species, and I suspect also in elephants. And then, of course, we've got one species whose culture has just gone totally berserk. And uh, so as an evolutionary biologist, you think, why this extraordinarily skewed distribution? If culture is useful, why don't they all have it? And if it's not useful, why do any of them have it? Well, here are some possible reasons. First is, actually, everybody has it. We just haven't looked well enough. And I suspect there's some of this, but um, that's not the whole story. Second, cognitive constraints. All the ones at the bottom of that, um, my last slide, are animals we think of as cognitively advanced. Um, so is co advanced cognition a prerequisite for culture? Well, people have been able to find social learning in animals which don't seem to be very cognitively advanced. So there's a bit of a, a paradox here. And it's possible that what's really going on is that those advanced uh, cognitive abilities are actually the result of advanced cultures. Second social structure, which um, Sue and others have talked about. Life history, animals are going to learn things from each other. If they live a lot of time with each other, they're more likely to learn important things. Environmental variation. Um, a number of studies, including one I've, I've made and I'll talk about more tomorrow, have shown that culture is a particular advantage in what one might call red noise environments, environments in which there's a lot of variation but it doesn't happen very fast. So li doing what others do is advantageous and a shortcut to achieving the best behavior for a particular environment. In contrast, when it, the environment's varying very fast, then it turns out that copying others doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It makes more sense to figure it out yourself. Okay, so let's go to the whales and dolphins. And, and apply some of these characteristics to them. They live long, um, over 100 years in some species. There's a lot of maternal care, a lot of um, possibilities for transferring information. They live in complex social structures with long-term bonds. They are cognitively advanced. And they, the ocean is a particular red noise environment. There's a lot of variation in the ocean over long time and spatial scales. Um, and much less over smaller ones. So all of these um, would seem to promote social learning and culture, although, as I said, the advanced cognitive abilities might, might, might be a result of this rather than a precursor for this. So now I'm going to move on to sperm whales. Um, the animal I study, this is how I study them. Uh, this is our 40-foot sailing boat off the Galapagos Islands. Um, trying to study sperm whales. And this is about as much as we normally see. So as you can, um, in fact, we're pretty lucky to see this much. So it's a difficult business. And that limits what I can tell you. Well, what about the sperm whale? It's the largest toothed whale. Um, an important aspect is that all this part of it is the most powerful sonar system in the natural world. The uh, most powerful sound in the natural world is produced by that. It's highly directional. It comes out here. Behind that is the largest brain on Earth. They're found 
in almost all the deep waters of the, of the world's oceans. And they are one of the most significant predators in these waters. It's estimated that sperm whales, even today after the reductions from whaling, take about as much out of the oceans as we humans do. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about female sperm whales, so just a tiny bit about males. Um, females are, are, are big animals, 15 tons, but nothing like the males, uh, three times the mass. There's another extreme of the sperm whales is in sexual segregation. The females and young are found in the tropics and subtropics, the males in the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, the females, as I'll talk about, are highly social. The males appear to be much more solitary. Well, the males return to low latitudes to breed when they start coming back when they're about 27. And here they rove singly between groups of females, spending just a little time with each. What I think the consequences of this are, are that the males spread genes around very well. And there's very little difference in the nuclear genes between different oceans. Um, but they don't move information around well because they don't spend very long with any of the permanent groups of females. So here are the females, and a lot of my work has been trying to figure out what's going on here. Why are these animals together? And this is the picture from our work in, in the waters of the central um, eastern Pacific. The basis seems to be the social unit, about 11 females and their young, um, nearly permanent membership, and not many of them are related, but some aren't. However, when we're out there, we tend to meet about 20 animals. Whoops, can I go back one? Sorry. Uh, about 20 animals, which is t two units, and they're moving together for a period of about 10 days or so. The females within these units and group, they move and feed together, covering hundreds or thousands of miles. They suckle each other's young. They babysit each other's young. They defend themselves communally from predators such as killer whales. So this is a very communal existence. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about their sounds. Um, sperm whales make loud clicks to find their food, but they also use the clicks to communicate. These are what are known as coders, and they're patterns of clicks used for communication. OK, so we've, um, these, these sounds uh, are actually much easier to analyze um, than parrot or dolphin vocalizations. It's just a series of clicks. And that's allowed us to, to look in some detail uh, how, how they're used. And uh, these, um, the whales of the Galapagos, um, we find that each unit has a particular dialect, but the dialects are very similar between bunches of units. So off the Galapagos, there are three what we call clans. The regular clan who go click, 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 click. The plus one, click, 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 click. Rather like the Canadian A at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and just occasionally off the Galapagos, we find the short clan, <laughs> click, click. <laughs> um, in one of the better bits of my research, I sailed all around the South Pacific recording these codas. Um, and um, oh, I'll get to that. The, the repertoires of the units are stable over years. So if one unit's regular now, it's regular 10 years later. And the units form groups only with units from their own clan, even though there are units from different clans in the same area. So yes, this is from our study across the South Pacific. The plus one clan just off Galapagos, Ecuador. This is where we heard them. The regular clan from there and down to central Chile. Four plus clan, click, 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 click. Uh, from central Chile up into the central Pacific, uh, a different clan in the Caribbean, and then that short clan, the one we occasionally heard in the Galapagos, we actually found right away the way across the South Pacific, all the way to New Zealand. So, four to five clans in the South Pacific, separate clans in the Caribbean. 2,000 to 10,000 kilometers, this huge spatial scale. The clans are sympatric. I mean, they, in any area, there's two or more clans, 
So you've got a, a system with what you might call multicultural society. In any area, animals are interacting with those who have a different dialect. And the clans contain tens of thousands of females. So this is a, these are large-scale structures. What produced them? Well, we've done the genetics, and there's virtually no difference at all between clans in the uh, nuclear genes. What about environmental differences plus individual learning? So the animals are learning different things in different places. No, they're in the same places. Ontogeny, so maybe the plus one were the young ones, the regular, the old ones. No, in each clan, there's all, all, all ages of whale. But the only thing left is culture. So we assume these clans are the result of culture. Um, but they are actually much more than dialect, these clans. We find that there's um, some mating and movement between clans to st stabilize the genes. As I said, they're sympatric, several clans in any area. They're large scale, distinct dialects, but there's also distinct habitat use and movement patterns. So they're behaving differently, consistently differently in the different areas. These result into differences in feeding success. So off the Galapagos Island, normally the regular clan um, has better feeding success. But when El Nino strikes, it switches, and the plus one clan does better. There are differences in reproductive success. So over the long term, um, some clans are producing more babies than other clans. So looking at the consequences of this, sperm whale um, uh, populations <coughs> seem more structured culturally than genetically or geographically. And if clans are differentially adapted to different areas and conditions, um, the effects of what we're doing to their environment may be particularly uncertain. So for instance, when we look at the long-term effects of whaling, because the behavior of the individuals in the different clans is different, it's likely that the rate at which they were being killed by these, at least by these kind of whalers, if not by the modern whalers who are much more efficient, were different. So as we look at the long-term effects of whaling, probably we should try and factor this in. Uh, global climate change. I mentioned that when El Nino strikes, the plus one clan units start doing better feeding-wise. Well, El Nino is a warming of the waters in the eastern tropical Pacific. Uh, global climate change is likely to produce more El Ninos, more El Nino-like conditions. So the, the, the conclusion is that the different clans will probably be differentially affected um, as the waters warm. A, a consequence of this, and from similar studies of, of other um, whale and dolphin species where we seem to have um, cultural diversity, is that we should conserve it. We should not only be trying to conserve genetic diversity of these animals, but we should try and conserve the diversity of information in the population, their cultures. Well, now getting to... Um, the focus of, of this meeting, how, what does whale culture tell us about human culture, or perhaps vice versa? We know very, very little of whale culture. It, they're very hard to study, and I suspect there's a huge amount out there. But what seems to be clear is that whale culture is not generally material or technological. Um, certainly not as material as chimpanzee culture and way, way below anything we humans have. They appear, as far as we can tell, to lack a syntactical language which is used in the wild. One can t seem to be able to teach them syntax in captivity, but there's, uh, so far, as far as I know, no evidence that they use this in the wild. But what it is, it's vocal culture, it's ecological, it's about how they use their environment. It's social, it's about how they interact with each other. So um, going back to this <laughs> book, um, 
one of the more provocative chapters is by the anthropologist Kim Hill. And he puts it fair and square. Non-humans do not have moral systems and do not reinforce social rules with symbolic display or signal adherence to specific sets of norms. So then I read that and thought, well, do sperm whales have moral systems? And a little after that, I, saw, I read a book by Donald Broom, who was uh, suggesting that many animals have moral systems. They have to have moral systems to live socially with each other when they can be dangerous to each other. And uh, for sperm whales, it came to me, this is particularly severe. So these sperm whales are making this extraordinarily powerful sound, which will undoubtedly um, temporarily deafen or perhaps permanently deafen each other if they aren't used carefully. Uh, they use these sonar systems 50% of the time. So 50% of the time, they're going click, click, click. And these are very, very powerful clicks. A and if any of those clicks was aimed at the hearing system of another sperm whale, it, it would be very bad news for that whale. So I liken this to a bunch of hunters out there in the woods. They're all using machine guns, and they're firing them over 50% of the time. For that to survive, and for those hunters, like these whales, to perhaps live over 100 years, they have to have a strong moral system. At least, that's my conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> well, but are these rules genetic or cultural? We don't know. Um, and I think it's very likely that whale culture contains ethnic, mar ethnic markers of social structures, such as the sperm whale coders, we don't know this for sure. There's rather better evidence that um, the killer whale calls are ethnic markers. And they may, perhaps, signal adherence to specific sets of norms. So in summary, although we know very little of whale culture, it seems very likely that these sophisticated cultures existed in the ocean millions of years before humans got culture, and that the social cultures of whales may provide important contrasts or, or examples to those of humans. And we should consider whale culture, both as we try to conserve them, as we decide how to treat them. And um, finally, this is just the start. We know very little. So thank you very much.